your spouse was gone you know, one weekend a month and a couple weekends in the summer. Now, because of the global war on terror, which is kind of an unending war, we have people being deployed over and over and over again. Hearing of a bomb going off or something like that is very stressful because I know that he could be in one of those trucks. See that government car pull in the driveway, it's not gonna be good news. So you just you worry about it. You think about it. Most families were not prepared for this, and neither were the communities around them prepared for this. This wasn't supposed to happen in the National Guard. From WRAL News, this is Focal Point. The National Guard and Reserve used to be a part-time military job, for the most part just a week in a month, two weeks a year. 9-11 and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan changed all that. Now these so-called citizen soldiers are being deployed to war zones for a year or more and often more than once. North Carolina has 23,000 citizen soldiers, more than most other states. Our focal point, the new role these men and women face, and the challenges it creates for both their families and our communities. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. Shannon Carroll is all about serving. Love you. He serves his family as a devoted husband and father. Get him, get him, get him. He serves his community as a youth basketball coach and a volunteer firefighter. He serves customers for Wake Electric as a service technician and lineman. Attention. And he serves his country Attention. in the Army National Guard. I've always loved helping other people. I just thought it was a good way to go. That's why Shannon called a National Guard recruiter. He told us, he said, you know, if you sign up now, it's pretty more than likely you will be deployed somewhere. And um, I was real hesitant. You know, I was like, well, yeah, I don't want you going nowhere. She's fine. Until then, Bridget and Shannon hadn't been anywhere. They grew up in this rural community outside Bunn. They met in high school and married soon afterward. Shannon got a job. Bridget took care of their daughters. It's okay. Don't know about you. Can't tell the difference. Together, they lived a modest and happy life in the country and rarely left the county until Shannon decided to cross the line. Even after he had signed on the dotted line, he actually became a little apprehensive himself, and we sat down and talked about it, and I was like, just, if you're going to do it, do it. But she backed me the whole time, 100%. Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it! Life went on, but it was a whole new ball game. Yeah! It's a hard feeling to explain, to know that, that any given day, that, you know, he could be gone. <laughs> that day came just seven months later. Hello? It was a weird day just to get that call. The call was for Shannon, only Shannon. Sorry, ma'am, we have to speak with him personally. I hung up the phone, I'm like, oh man. Because when they won't tell me, I knew that's what it was when they wouldn't tell me. I think the hardest day out of the whole entire situation with him being in the National Guard was the day he left to go to basic training. Once he got on that van and headed to the airport, he, you know, he was, he belonged to the government. Basic training lasted six months. Those first two weeks were really hard. I mean, I, for two weeks, I heard nothing from it. Accelerate, march! Oh! Shannon was assigned to a unit close to home, the 1132nd Military Police Company in Rocky Mount. But when his deployment orders came, he was sent to help fill a shortage of military police from a unit in Asheville. They were sent to guard prisoners at Iraq's Camp Buka. Our facility was anything from robbers, murderers, people attacking coalition forces, any, any kind of criminal offense you can think of, we had them. You got a lot of people caged up for a long time, they get ill and get frustrated and want to go home and they riot. 
Shannon handled riots on the inside, rode in convoys on the outside, Sitting down, and no, stateside, there was a lot of explaining to do to two little girls. It was really hard to, to do that transition from, you know, Daddy went to be a soldier, but he's going to be home. And then a few months later, oh, well, Daddy's not going to be home anymore. Come on back. Next, Shannon's transition from civilian to military life. Did you do all your center work today, Nikki? And how it challenged his wife's life at home. You run yourself ragged. And then in the back of your mind, even though you don't think you're thinking about it, it's there. You know, he's in Iraq. He's in the middle of a war zone. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have led to the largest call-up of the Guard and Reserve since World War II. Those citizen soldiers make up nearly half our forces there. But those men and women are more than just soldiers. They're bankers, nurses, plumbers, just ordinary folks who live and work in our communities. And when they're sent off to war, their spouses and children are left here at home with their own battles to fight. All right, get your teeth brushed. It's 6.30 on a weekday morning. Get in the bathroom and brush your teeth. And Bridget Carroll has her hands full with 10-year-old Alex and 7-year-old Nikki. Both of them are elementary school age kids, stomach viruses, you know, flus, all that good stuff. Yeah, let me get it straightened up. Bridget mends them and tends to them. You want eggs or waffles? Taking them to school, dance, ball games, and back. Seat belts, please. Little stuff like that that people don't think about helps immensely to have two parents in the house to help do. Y'all ready? And I didn't think it would make a big difference until um, he was gone for a flipping year. <laughs> While husband Shannon policed an Iraqi prison, Bridget policed their Way County home. Where you at? And it helps to have dad for discipline, too. She um, had a hard time taking care of us by herself. That's the truth. It's hard. It was hard. It was harder than I thought it was going to be. No more dad taking over in the Nikki, afternoons when he came home from work. What's your homework? Where he could sit down and help them with their homework and give me a break from them. Well, 11 months of no break, actually longer because of the time he was at Bragg and all the training. Yeah, that, that's really, I think, what I miss the most. Oh, I worried about him every day, wondering what's going on at home. Did I sign everybody's folders? Because I, I know what she's got here between dance and cooking and school and everything else is, is a burden. Change the station. I left them behind and I felt bad about it and I, I really did. I had a hard time with it. I felt like I just abandoned them. That's pretty much what I had done. The internet and a webcam helped. With the internet, it made it a lot easier. I can go on in line and talk to her on the computer and see her. That little bring on the computer, just when I hear that noise, I, would, I mean, I would bolt to the computer to see if it was him. But a computer couldn't fill the void Bridget felt at the end of the day. When the girls would go to bed at night, and it was quiet in here, there was many 2 or 3 o'clock a.m.s for me. You know, I just lay there, lay in the bed, watch the time roll by. And that's when you really start to think. It's like, well, if he'd have been there for that, if he'd have been there for that. And you, you, I do, you know, you do tear up. You, I mean, I, I did cry myself to sleep many nights. The whole thing was new to us. Neither one of our parents, our parents, you know, that we knew, nobody's military. So I couldn't talk to none of them about what I was going through, about what I was feeling. They're like, oh, you're, you, you know, you're doing fine. You're going, you know, look at you. you. Ain't nothing wrong with you. You're fine. And I'm like, well, no, not really. Bridget felt like no one understood. I mean, that was hard. That was hard, knowing that he was over there doing what he was doing, and the people back here, other than just our immediate close friends and family, Nobody was thinking about it. it had, you know, it's already so many years into this conflict or this war, and nobody cares anymore. One sleepless night around 3 a.m., Bridget finally called an Army counselor. Just have somebody to talk to, you know, um, find out if there was some technique, something they could tell me, some way to help me, you know, just to get some sleep, because I didn't think I was stressing. I didn't think I was worried. Um, <clears throat> apparently I was. 
Eventually, Bridget connected with other wives who were going through the same thing. Three o'clock in the morning, we're sitting there eating ice cream, talking on the phone. They couldn't sleep, I couldn't sleep. The girls understood. Very, well, she's a lot very more fast. stressed. She's a lot more stressed. I guess I can say the hardest thing about him being gone and thinking about it was when he was on convoys. You know, and keeping them away from the news. Nikki was too young to fully understand why daddy was gone. He missed her kindergarten. He, he missed her whole year, first year of school. Every day she asked, when's daddy coming home? When's daddy coming home? Christmas was really tough. With Shannon gone, so was his overtime pay. I mean, I had to call some bill, you know, bill people and, and defer a couple of months payments until I could get caught back up and get back current. Christmas 2004. Lean times meant a leaner Christmas. You know, we, w we would set his overtime money aside and save it for a holiday. Merry Christmas, Daddy. <laughs> Bridget put a picture of Shannon on the tree, but he wasn't there to help put the toys together or clean up afterward. I'm trying to open you. I just sat down and just quit at Christmas. I actually just quit. Uh, I stopped, I sat down, I looked at the tree, I looked at all the mess that needed to be done, and I, I just sat there and just, you know, just wondered what he was doing. A few weeks later, stress took its toll. Bridget suffered a heart attack. It was all stress. No health problems, healthy, 31 year old, not overweight. It was all stress. Shannon flew home on emergency leave, carrying a burden of guilt. I knew I shouldn't have been away from home. I shouldn't have done this in the first place. I ain't there to do what I'm supposed to be. You know, you if I was there. Guilt. I said, if I was there, it maybe wouldn't happen, and, and I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Shannon arrived home on Valentine's Day. By then, Bridget was out of the hospital. Less than three weeks later, she had to take him back to the airport to return to Iraq. I just didn't want to leave him. Bridget sat out on the airport parking deck, hoping to see his plane. And it probably took a couple hours of just sitting at the airport, watching planes take off. That was bad. Our military prepares our citizen soldiers for a war zone, but what about the battles families like the Carrolls face back at home? I think it takes a conscious effort to bring the families to the front line, to see that they are our heroes at home, that they're sacrificing, that they're serving too. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. The families of guardsmen and reservists going off to war have suddenly found their civilian lives disrupted. Suddenly they're living like full-time military families, only most don't live on or near military bases. That's creating new challenges, not only for those families, but also for their communities and the military. Hi, this is Rena Wethington with the North Carolina National Guard Family Assistance Center. The National Guard's Family Assistance Center in Morrisville provides services and activities for the families of deployed guardsmen, including a once a month call to check in. Okay, you take care now. Bye bye. What happens lots of times is that we discover people who are struggling but haven't quite gotten to the point that they're ready to yell for help. Uh, we're calling today just to check on you and see how things are going. You just say, this is so and so, you know, how are you doing? And the tears start. Bridget Carroll got one of those calls. We became aware around Christmas time that while they were making it, they were barely making it and there weren't extras. The center offered Bridget a chance to sign up for things she might need at Christmas. And I was real apprehensive. I was like, I, you know, I didn't want a handout. I didn't want anybody to help me. I was just going to try to do it on my own. And the ladies convinced me to just write it down. Bridget wrote two bicycles. A local civic organization bought them. Soldiers at the Morrisville Armory put them together. Bridget met one of the soldiers when she went to pick up the bikes. And I hugged him like he was my husband. And I was crying. I was like, oh, thank you so much. I said, you just, you just don't realize. I said, I wasn't expecting it. Well, let's give them a call and see if we can get them to attend our potluck this uh, Friday. Yeah, As the number of citizen soldiers being deployed has increased, so has the number of family assistance centers in communities across the state. The Army has Fort Bragg, and the Marines have Camp Lejeune. The National Guard's base is its community. 
there are families stuck in rural areas with soldiers gone. You know, it's not just the ones on bases or the ones that live near bases, it's everywhere. And our communities are so good at saying, how's your soldier? And forgetting to say, how are you? Concern for Guard and Reserve families led to the creation of the Citizen Soldier Support Program. It's a federally funded pilot being tested by UNC Chapel Hill. Professor Dennis Ordner oversees the program. He says the new role of the Guard and Reserve has created a new challenge for its civilian families. The families now face the reality, first of all, that, they're, that they are actually military families. In many cases, they didn't even consider themselves that before. So that's the first um, kind of identity issue. An issue that hits home with the first deployment to a war zone. Without the support structure found on military bases, many Guard and Reserve families have only their communities to turn to. And it's those local communities that right now just don't have a clue about how to help. The Citizen Soldier Support Program is trying to change that by mobilizing community resources to support Guard and Reserve families. Dave, I really appreciate you and all the guys doing this for our families. This is one example of how the community can help. Purple Elephant, a nonprofit in Raleigh that refurbishes old computers, is donating some to the Morrisville Family Assistance Center. The center will give them to the children of guard families who otherwise could not afford them. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Community support groups are also forming to help spouses of the deployed. Welcome tonight. This one is sponsored by Triangle Baptist Church. The families come here and each one of them have found a special friend in the support group and they can call each other 24-7 and talk, cry, scream, whatever they want to do. They can also call us or call me anytime. Just having a very hard time with the holidays. Felicia McDaniel's husband is an insurance salesman in civilian life. Now he's pulling guard duty in Iraq and she worries. Every single day, every hour. She says the support group has helped. At my first meeting there, it was wonderful. Those ladies and the people of that church have just wel welcomed you in, and um, it's just been wonderful to go there and to have a support group to talk to. I mean, you know, to listen to other women who are going through deployment at the same time that you are. Out of the road. Next, this citizen soldier returns home, but for how long? There's really no such thing as a citizen soldier anymore. It's a if you join the National Guard right now, you are a soldier. That's plain and simple. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. To learn more about the issues covered in this episode of Focal Point, go to WRAL.com and click on News. There's no question the role of our citizen soldiers has changed dramatically since 9-11, creating new challenges for their families. The good news is that organizations from across our state are coming together to support them. The question is, with no end in sight to the wars, will it be enough? Everybody happy? After seven months of training and 11 months in Iraq, Shannon Carroll finally returned home. It was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it was absolutely wonderful. It was better than the day I married him. It was just, he's home. You know, Iraq's behind him. It was really overwhelming, the feeling and the, like a burden's been lifted off you. It's like a sigh of relief to know you're back. Yeah, when I didn't exist for a while, you know. <laughs> it, it really did come down to that. I mean, they, they would come in the house and for once, oh, for once in 11 months, I didn't hear mama, mama, mama. You know, I heard daddy, daddy. I'm like, he's over there, go. Shannon went back to his job at Wake Electric. They held my job for me, um, same position, uh, same title. The only thing different when I got back was I got a new truck to drive around on. Oh yeah, I loved online work. I, I really loved online work. The law requires employers to rehire deployed employees when they return. Even though Shannon missed out on overtime, Wake Electric made up the difference between his civilian and military pay. And it's really to um, give more support to the family so that uh, when this person's away, in particular, that the family's not going to suffer because of that. 
out of thousands of deployed guardsmen and reservists who returned from deployment to North Carolina last year, the U.S. Department of Labor says only 14 filed complaints against their civilian employers for not following the law. The employers really get behind the guardsmen and reservists, and, and they've done a tremendous job of helping and supporting us. Guard and reserve employees will need that to continue. The current plans are that a soldier, sailor, airman, marine that is part of the uh, guard or reserve, that that person is going to be gone anywhere from a year to two years out of every five. One, two, three, one, zero. Shannon has been back six months long enough to be eligible for another deployment. So how do you feel about getting another call then to do that? Butterflies starting again. I'm not going, I hate to say I'm not going to worry about it. I'll wait till I, the time comes and then I'll deal with it when it gets here. That's something I really don't want to worry about right now, so I'll wait till it gets here. If he had to go back, if it was like mandatory, then the longest time I could stand, well, I would stand for, would be about two months. It will likely be much longer than that. Some of the active army guys I've talked to, they don't even call us citizen soldiers no more. That's just no such thing.